Hello, everyone. On behalf of my colleagues, welcome to this month's talk from the Johns Hopkins Institute for Assured Autonomy seminar series, co-sponsored by the Computer Science Department of the Whiting School of Engineering. Each month, we host a talk on research topics at the intersection of assurance and autonomy. This seminar, this seminar will be recorded. Today's speaker is Dr. Dinesh Manocha. Dr. Manocha is a Paul Christman Iribi Chair in Computer Science and ECE and Distinguished University Professor at the University of Maryland College Park. His research interests include virtual environments, physically-based modeling, and robotics. His group has developed a number of software packages that are standard and licensed to 60-plus commercial vendors. He has published more than 700 papers and supervised 43 PhD dissertations. He is a fellow of the AAAI, AAAS, ACM, and the IEEE, member of the ACM SIGGRAPH Academy, and the Bezier Award from Solid Modeling Association. He received the Distinguished Alumni Award from IIT in Delhi at the, at the Distinguished Career in Computer Science Award from the Washington Academy of Sciences. He was a co-founder of Impulsonic, a developer of physics-based audio simulation technologies, which was acquired by Valve Incorporated in November 2016. Today, Dr. Minocha will talk about robotic navigation in complex indoor and outdoor environments. Welcome, Dinesh, and over to you. Thank you, David. Uh, can you folks hear me well? Yes. Yes. Great, great. So I bring my PowerPoint slide. Can you see the whole screen with my title? Yes. yes. Great, thank you. Thank you, David, for your kind words. It's a pleasure to be, you know, I always feel of, uh, you know, Hopkins as an APL as part of our greater DMV family. Lots of great friends and collaborators at both uh, robotics at uh, at APL and as and also the collaboration IA. We have been trying to you know have many many point things with with David, Jim, and and Rama Chalapa. Lots of great friends there. So I'm going to talk a little bit about one of the projects my group at UMD with my students have been working on, especially dealing with robot navigation, what I call complex indoor and outdoor environments. Um, you know, this is mostly work done with my some of my current and former students. You know, a few of them have graduated. We have actually a big army cooperative agreement, and this is you know a lot of our work on outdoor robotics is supported by them. Uh, besides collaboration with them, we also have a ties with Lab 126 at Amazon, and some of me have seen they introduce a commercial product called Astro, which is they're just shipping it out right now, and hopefully I'll show some results with Amazon too. But let's 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 jump into it. You know, this is. 2023, right? Uh, I've been in this area for what, 30, 40 years, and this isn't there isn't a more cool time to talk about robotics. You know, this is this is this is just in my whole life, this is great time to robotics because of all the excitement, not just because of media hype, but robotics and autonomy are just you know penetrating every aspect of a life. And I think we are everybody now does talk about chat GPT, which is fantastic, but I can bet you, you know. In next 5, 10, 20 years, this some kind of semi-automatic robotics or fully autonomous robotics is going to enter mainstream life. We're just, just as the cusp of it that we're getting to it. So that's that's a potential that makes a life very exciting. And you see all these robots here. You know, when Tesla introduces something, you know, they make a lot of hype, but they're helping the field in some way. Tesla bought with a lot of a sport robot with you know Boston Dynamics, which is getting a big investment from Hyundai. And of course, you know, Hopkins itself has been the biggest place in medical robotics. So I can come and learn from you guys, you know, all the great folks you have there. So lots of lots of wonderful things happening there. But just let's look at, you know, a few of these successes, you know, even the field is not new. Uh, one of the biggest successes in robotics in last 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 decade has been the warehouse automation. You know, I work with Amazon a lot, and you know, they are not deploying half a million robot used to ship a billion items. They want to automate the, about these warehouses. They also acquired uh, iRobot, which is still going through. And as I said, you know, a lot of big investments like Hyundai invested big time in the whole new institute, $400 million. And of course, within DOD and within lots of other, uh, other, other applications, you see robots are increasingly used for, you know, material handling, transportation, this thing. So this is, it's a very big spectrum of good things are happening. Now, robotics is very big. And you know, there are places which have now robotic centers, robotic institute. And my friend at the University of Michigan even now have a robotics department, just like your department of mechanical engineering, 
Department of Computer Science, they have a Department of Robotics having its own major. So it's a huge field. Uh, some of the research I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna narrow it down and focus it down. It's just a one part of robotics project, you know, called navigation, you know. How can we make a robot, you know, move autonomously? Especially, I know this is uh, IAA, autonomy is a big focus of IAA. So how can we do autonomous navigation? Basically make the robot move in any arbitrary environment. And I'll show you the arbitrariness of the environment. This also includes autonomous driving, you know, we deal with it. So the three big challenges in this thing, you know, autonomy is, we all talk about autonomy and, you know, as I work more in autonomy, my one take message from today's talk is autonomy is still too hard. You know, we're come, we're making good progress, but trying to achieve assured autonomy, explainable autonomy or robust autonomy, at least even the context of robotics, I, I feel we are, we are a long way to go. So that's, that's clearly the, you know, the challenge is there. Then, one challenge we have to move is robots should move smoothly and safe because we're at, robots are being used next to humans, right? And, and just like autonomous cars are given next to human drivers, robots are coming in human environments. You see what, what Amazon is doing there. And thirdly, you know, as robots enter our daily life, humans interact with humans all the time. How will humans interact with robots? This is, this is an area which is getting a lot of attention, but we're still in the infancy of that, you know, because we don't have very good robots right now. As the robots get better, how do we go ahead with that? So this is where lots of fun is gonna be happening here. But just an example of this robots use. So the, the good thing of robot success story is, these are like warehouses or some factory that I've just played with video. Active advantage. Since rolling out the Kiva robot across its fulfillment centers, by 2018, they had 100,000 of them. By now that figure has comfortably surpassed 200,000. Amazon Robotics have been refining the design still further. The new iteration of Kiva, known as Pegasus, is 10 centimeters shorter, meaning more can be stopped on top. So this is one of Amazon video. Now this is in warehouses. As I said, it's a huge success. But one thing I want to make it very clear, warehouses are designed to be robot friendly. You know, they, there are no humans involved. They keep open spaces. They put the light sensors on the ground, all the sensors and lights. So they definitely, Robots are very successful because warehouses are robot friendly. Everything in life is good. <laughs> and on the other hand, in the project we're doing with Amazon, Amazon induced robot, if you can sign up, it's only $200. They want to make robot work in everybody's home. This is an example of Amazon infomercial. <laughs> robot. Yes. What are we going to do with a robot? Well, Astro, follow me. So there are a bunch of examples. They think you have a cute robot at home. It's a small robot, like a puppy style. Play with you. So this is, as I said, consumer robot Amazon introduced, and there are some delays because of some manufacturing, but you yeah. can remote monitoring, you know? And now I totally believe you. <laughs> so this is one example of Amazon robot. Now, these are two good examples. Your warehouses are very robot friendly, but most of us, if you come to my home, you know, as my people might say, my home is always my room is always messy, and and you're dealing with a different kind of furniture, different kind of cables on the floor, different kind of bags on the floor. The robot has to adjust to it. In fact, one of the hardest places, and and this will be surprising to many people, robots can work, is actually your bathrooms. You know, why do you want robots in a bathroom? There's a whole privacy question, but leave that aside all the lights and all the mirrors and all the glass doors make robots very hard. So the point is, you know, can we make robot work in a home? That's a challenge now Amazon dealing with, with the $200 product right here. Of course, they also law robot, they did a project on delivery here, like getting all delivery from robots. So this was a Scott project. Amazon actually called this off recently after spending four and a half years and billions of dollars because it's working on your street and bringing a package to you. And you see a few isolated spaces, you know, some airport robot being deployed or such George Mason University as food. Here was some work I was doing with my former students at Hong Kong University. And the, what I want to contrast to you on the left was a nice street, clean. On the right, here's a robot dealing with people. So, 
this is what our own robot with all the autonomous sensing and following a, like a like a, a crowded market in Hong Kong or streets, right? So there's a big difference between what you saw on the left and what you see in the right, what happens there. So we are really trying to address these problems. When can the robot work in unstructured environments? So the classification we use is that warehouses are structured and some factories are structured, your homes and your street are unstructured. And the best way to contrast that is look at the biggest investment in robotics the last decade has been autonomous driving. And autonomous driving is nothing else but robot on the road, trying to navigate, take you from point A to point B. You see the big company, the Googles, the Crews, Amazon, Zooks, are, they spent tens of billions of dollars. And you can see they have some partial success. You can see them deployed in Phoenix, San Francisco, and LA. And I wonder why, because there's a typical Google video. They have taken this roads, mapped it to every single millimeter, and driven like God knows millions of miles and trained the rope, the autonomous vehicle for this environment. You see all the sensors and good things, things are happening. Of course, they go to LA and Phoenix and 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 uh, and uh, and you know and, and 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 San Francisco because the weather is mostly sunny, the roads are a little bit clean, there's no snow. I guess they don't have to deal with the bad roads of Maryland, at least not in College Park. So that's where it works. Now, this is of course a small sense of traffic. What autonomous car, the question, this is a traffic setting in Asia, you will see very congested. You see different agents, humans, bicycles, people. So the question comes up is when can autonomous driver and car deal with this, like this traffic junctions? So on the left, what you see is success story, which is I call structure after tens of billions of dollars. Whereas a big fraction of the world traffic is on the right. We are a long way to go. So this is where challenge comes up, you know, how can you navigate in different kinds of home and this thing? So this brings up the basic idea, you know, this is the old classic pipeline that you put a lot of sensors and you have, you know, uh, uh, you know, planning and move. So there are three components you will see right here, perception, planning and move uh, control. This is where it comes up together that you a lot of sensing. This is like, you know, we sense the world. Even humans are multimodal sensing. We look at multiple sensing, vision dominates, uh, audio, touch comes up. Planning and decision-making, you know, somehow human brain and, and sensing are well integrated. You know, you react, sometimes reflect in an unconscious mode. You sense, plan, and you take an action. So this is the basic thing comes up. The one thing, these problems are not new. All of the, the different communities and traditionally, they were the sensing, computer vision, 50 years old, robotics planning, another 50 years old, control action actuators, 50 years old. Now, the two challenge comes up is these communities have developed a lot of wonderful technologies in isolation. Now, when we build an autonomous systems, challenge number one, how do you combine them? And when you combine the new challenges come up. The other thing boost that came up in the last decade was that all these techniques are using machine learning, which hopefully is a big plus, you know, all the machine learning has own can of worms. It can do a lot of things. So we deploy machine learning, especially in computer vision, machine learning was a big game changer, you know, deep learning has a big success. And even in robotics, some reinforced learning have been done. But as we combine machine learning for different methods, the, the limitation of machine learning get amplified. So this is what I call the Ambrose law. In computer vision, having 95% perception is considered a big success, but when I combine perception and planning and control, the 5% failure case of computer vision get amplified. So this is the integration, you know, makes the problem much, much harder. That's what we deal with here. So part of our goal is to how to develop solution, we do that. So I'm going to show you some of the work we've done. First, I start with indoor scenes, then I do with outdoor scenes, something we're doing with army, and then I'll time, I'll show you briefly an excavation we develop. Like a, one example of here, if you have a very customized problem, you can achieve good commercial success. So indoor scene is the one, you know, this is the kind of robots we build in our lab. They're not pretty. They're definitely not pretty as uh, what Amazon Astro does, but Amazon has a big marketing budget and big manufacturing budget. We took like this nice turtle bot robot, a jackal the turtle bot, put this sensor, you'll see some cameras, you see some LIDARs. And if you see this laptop tied up with, with kind of clumsy looking white string, is because with the laptop GPU for machine learning. So you take all the sensor data and you perform a lot of machine learning based navigation, the enforcement scheme and do it. So this is how the robot is moving automatically. And the idea is we borrow ideas from deep reinforcement learning, which I'm not going to details of that. It's been pretty popular in many robotic application and also navigation. We are not the first one to do it. 
The challenge that came here in this work was that what sensors you take. Uh, in the autonomous industry, you know, if you buy a Tesla, they only use cameras. But if you go to Google Waymo cars, which I don't think are for sale available right now, they use a lot of LIDARs. So should we do more cameras, more LIDARs? What's the combination? That, that's a weird thing. Our feeling is to use both. But the challenge comes out to, you know, the sensor complementary between multimodal sensing. But our goal was to deal with occluded environments. You know, if the environment is open, navigation is an easy problem. But when the crowd gets fun, environment gets bad. Like think of the crowds in a mall or crowds in an airport or, you know, some other public places. We build a lot of work on three things, you know, there are predictions are moving. So we use a lot of computer vision method, including ours for pedestrian trajectory prediction. Now to make machine learning work, what's called deep reinforcement learning, it's all based on training data. So we use our simulation framework. You know, my group had a lot of work on simulating crowds and we also built some open source packages. We literally took those sim to real, you know, we train a lot in simulation. Now this is, it's a concept used in lots of machine learning applications and some places it works well, some doesn't. Luckily in this application, our sim to real worked okay. So, so that's where we have partial success. The other application, some, you know, missing news work on aerial video recognition where it's not working as well as we like to be. But literally we take in simulation, we can make millions of scenarios, multi-trade training and do with that. So this is, you know, how different ideas comes up. There are a lot of pedestrian detectors available, like a YOLO, it's a series of wonderful work in computer vision, we build on that. Not only detect, a big chunk in navigation is you want to predict where the pedestrian would be three seconds from now. And since my robot is only two feet high, we're focusing on people's leg. Normally when you look at people, you look at their face or top body, but we are looking at how their legs are moving because the robot has to navigate and use that to predict it. So this is just to show our system works. You got a sensor like a LiDAR, a depth camera, a goal and a velocity vector. You train a policy and in every instance, you come with a new collision order policy. So this is like the, the sensing, the planning and the control. And you want to do this like maybe 100 frames a second because the world is changing real time. The, the goal also was to make sure the robot should move smoothly, especially this robot is supposed to be moving among pedestrians, you know. And you want this robot to navigate in a smooth manner in a crowd, just like other humans do. Because if a robot coming next to you and jerking around, there'll be all kind of HRI acceptable issues that'll come up there. So here the system we put together, this is about now two years ago. Basically this was shot before COVID, but we are continue building on that. Let me show you what it can do. So this is showing, you know, how all this computer vision, simulation-based training and, and, and policy optimization for planning come together. This is the building of Arib Lobby. You know, it's, of course, we're back to the same crowds again. Totally unplanned, you know, and you can see sometimes students can be a little bit nasty, right? They just want to come and be your obstacles and robot has to avoid. So this is just dealing in a tense crowd. And, you know, to the best of our knowledge, we were trying to push the limit of the crowd. The goal was, can a robot go in a dense crowd? Of course, the challenge is this robot is only less than two feet high. And how people react to two feet robot is not the same as they react to a five or six feet human. But this shows you behind the scene components and that you know how you track people. Tracking at least in visual become quite good. So we, we leverage computer vision work and dense tracking, but we do prediction. You know, prediction will be trying to see how things are going around here. And you know, I'll, I'll move the video slightly more. You can see prediction coming here. And we of course perform comparisons with lots of different methods. This is where the simulation comes in picture. So this is, we simulate different sensing and you can see our crowd simulation framework. We look into different movements of pedestrians, what each sensor is. So having this simulator really helped us a lot, training all kinds of difficult situations because getting real data for training simulation is not easy here. We put it all together and towards the end, you know, different sensing comes up and we'll show some, you can see some number, especially in some very dense crowd setting, you know, we show our method and combination of sensors give good performance. So sometimes, you know, people are really mean, they come in just in front of the robot and stop. So this is like the, the nasty case, we call a freezing problem, I'll talk about that, we face freezing problem, but sometimes, you know, robot can anticipate how people are moving in a void. So this was, you know, the first attempt of doing what I call navigation in indoor scene. Now this example of a corridor where you will see that you have a T-junction or, or some occlusion. You don't know a sudden sharp turner comes, you know, humans, sometimes you're turning and somebody comes, you say, excuse me, but you know, we are trying to deal with occlusion or non-line of sight and those kind of problems. 
So this was the first attempt we did. But one challenge that's a very big problem in robot navigation is freezing, that whenever the robot cannot be sure how to move around, they just stop. Now, it's okay to have the safety mechanism, but if the robots are going to be deployed in real world scene, you don't want too many robots and stopping in front of you because that's going to avoid the flow. And we talked to some people in malls and airports, and even Walmart was thinking about these robots. The last thing they want is the robots should stop the traffic because the robots come and stop this, this kind of traffic, you know, of the movement is called disruption. In fact, we talked to one of the airport companies. They want to build what is called autonomous wheelchairs. You know, people sit down, instead of a human pushing the wheelchair to a, to a destination goal, can the wheelchair go through it? And one of the biggest concerns airports have, you know, as airport air traffic is going up peak, people want to move very fast. They don't want the wheelchairs to disrupt the flow. So that's a very critical issue for them. And also other thing challenge they have is a lot of airport use glass. You know, it, the glass looks pretty, gives you nice light, but glass always gives problem for me. So we're dealing with problems like how do robots flow in a crowd without affecting the crowd flow and how deal with glass. That is still a glass. That is still a big challenge. But at least for the freezing problem, you know, how do we minimize freezing? We still can't avoid freezing, but can we make it less conservative? That's the challenge we're dealing with here. So this is an example you see. Robots see a bunch of people here. It cannot make an easy decision. I could go around it. It just freezes. So this is a problem they note not very frequently. You know, even if you're Roomba at home, it also freezes at time. How do we do it better? So in this case, you know, what we try to do, we say, okay, Machine learning is great. It can give you a lot of great examples, but machine learning has limitations, right? There are a lot of cases, you know, it can't make a good decision because your training was not good enough for the environment. And we go back to classical navigation. That's the background I came from, you know, what we call motion planning, take geometry, math, physics, and all the optimization ideas and form collision. So we try to actually combine the DRL methods for deep reinforcement learning with some traditional model base and try to get the both of words. And the idea is that DRL method works well in lots of sensing uncertainty, but they cannot provide guarantees on reducing the freezing motion. At the same time, the traditional methods were designed well for good guarantees, but they don't work in real world scenes. So the goal was, can we combine the best? Take the best of what machine learning can do, combine the reliability of that. So this is our step to developing more robust solution, which, which machine learning itself cannot do. So I will not go into details of that. There are a bunch of papers we have published, but just to give you a high level idea, you know, here's a robot, it's only three degrees of freedom. It's only on the ground that makes our life easier, X, Y, and theta. And this is the environment, imagine all these dots and reds are pedestrians. So these pedestrians are moving. Now, when we humans go, we are very good at looking where humans are moving and we plan the path. If this pedestrian moving like this, we go like this, like this. So humans are really good at prediction and planning accordingly in real time. And you adjust. We want the same thing in robots to see how humans are moving or how the obstacles are moving and just move smoothly, just like the humans could do. So we built a lot of work on pedestrian movement and there's a whole community in, you know, people look at pedestrian movement, both physiological and psychological factors. We build on those ideas. We look at density of the crowd, how you move in a dense setting, what biggest stride you give, and there's a cultural factor here, you know, in the Western world, we like to have personal space. But if you ever go to the Orient or Asia, the crowd density is very high. You don't get personal space. People sometimes just hit you or push you and they don't even say sorry. So a lot of factors come up there and we take into account how crowds people move in the modeling of the crowd. So this is what we call, it's a big area right now called socially acceptable navigation, that the robot should move and be totally acceptable to the community. Otherwise, you know, people won't like it because they don't want robot to be a, a, a nuisance. They don't want robots to be uh, affecting the flow. Remember airports care a lot about pedestrian flow. They don't want to stop the flow because they want a quick turn around as people changing gates or arriving to the flights or leaving the flights. So the goal here is, you know, how can robot move and pass in a navigable manner? So this is the challenge we're facing. So initially we built into like simulators, you know, how robots can work in a, in a smooth manner in a crowded setting. So one of the methods we introduced called frozen or frozen. This is like, you know, what are the areas where we can robot navigate in a smooth manner? And take the dual of the statement, what are the areas 
where robots can have freezing. So we call it a notional called potential freezing zone. You know, as the people are moving, here is some region around every pedestrian. If you don't enter that, you'll be good. So the goal is to compute some potential freezing zone using some geometric and physics methods, and then making sure robots don't enter that. So if we away from the potential freezing zones, life is life is good. So this is there's a lot of math behind it. You know, we look into how pedestrians are moving, take into account pedestrian density. There are also heuristics to take into account cultural factors, or there are no good techniques for cultural modeling. But combine them together to figure out a notion of potential freezing zone and, and look, look at it like this. So again, I will not just go into the details of that, but this is showing you know all the for every pedestrian, we figure out the math, what the potential freezing zone would be, and use that to look into account combining robot pedestrian. So this is very typical in you know, all these papers you see that whenever you present new methods, you know, we perform a lot of comparisons. So our method is a new method called frozen plus DRL. This is our you know, model based and reinforcement learning. And we compare previous method based by other authors, and we showed you know, that our success rate is not perfect, but much better than state of the art. So this gives you dealing much better results in multiple ways. One is that we, we get success in high covariance rate. And then we also make sure the path is smooth. We don't want robot to be jerky because the jerkiness is not going to be liked by human. That comes up there. So this is the kind of example we're doing. And you see some bunch of numbers, you know, that we got quite a bit of improvement in both the success rate as well as, as, well as friendliness. So here's an example of, you know, robot doing. Is estimating the freezing zone and trying to avoid that and therefore ensuring smoother navigation. So this again, you see a little bit of waviness, you know, that, that happens because of the nature of sensing. It's not 100% smooth, we like it to be, but at least, you know, it's kind of walking among the crowd in a smooth manner, hoping that, of course, it catches some human attention, but if humans are walking their own way, just like they ignore the pedestrians, they go along with that. So this is an example of, you know, how the robot goes as humans are walking with furniture around, it smoothly navigates. So this is the kind of a thing we're doing. And again, it's not, we still cannot eliminate freezing because our approach is conservative and we still cannot get 100% smooth paths, but we still come a long way in dealing with, you know, what is called navigation behavior. So this is just the work on indoor navigation and, and we're playing with that. Uh, does anybody have a question before I jump to the outdoor navigation? In case anybody has a question, just please ask. Go ahead. Yes, I have a question, Dinesh. Please. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I know that uh, uh, Chen Min Huang and Yi Zhang Huang uh, have been working on um, the added twist of the societal conventions when people are walking together, you know, we normally as humans, we don't just barge between two people walking together. And um, have, did you, in your work, did you look at that also aside from just, you know, trying to avoid um, the individual pedestrians, but also sort of clusters of pedestrians walking together? Technically, the robot could go between them, but it would be, you know, humans would consider it to be rude to do so. Yeah, great question. I've seen Chen Ming's work work. His, his work is very nice. He's done some really good work on what we call human robot interaction. So I think, uh, let me answer your question in two parts. Actually, we did publish a paper last year. We call it COMET. I'm not presenting it here, but we try to identify groups of people. And exactly the point that you mentioned, you know, if it's a cohesive group, like a family of four or a couple or just friends, you want robot to award them as a group and not go in the middle. So we have done some preliminary work on that. But one thing I would say is, you know, we still need to do much better evaluation of as the robots get into, into the society. We are still developing technologies. And, and I think we have to do much thorough. In fact, somebody made an observation. We were just testing in our own building. They found that actually this, I don't want to, it's a too small a sample that some of the male people in the, in the room were actually coming and being of the robots and, and actually some of the women participants avoided the robots. So it's a how human reacted, it's a very small sample. So I think what you're hitting at is a very important point that as we develop technology for navigation matures, how do we make it more friendly in society? So the human robot interaction, the kind of work Chen Ming Wang other people do, 
is going to become a big part of this research in the future. Hi, Dinesh. Thank I, you. I have a question also. What do I do to? I think I'm getting a feedback loop. One second. Do I turn no, this? Go ahead. Okay, okay, yeah, I have a question also. also. Sorry, sorry about the feedback loop. Um, so I, I see that, you know, it's pretty, pretty amazing stuff that you're able to have a robots avoid people and predict their positions and make make changes. What about the other way around? Um, how do how do how do the robots how do robots acknowledge their presence to people? And how do people kind of, you know, navigate that as well? Meaning to say, sometimes even person to person, you run into a person in the hallway and you both move to the left or the right until you finally figure it out. How do how do robots and people interact as well in, in that kind of situation? So another great question. You're also again asking question on HR, that's the thing. So, you know, I tell you a couple of things we did. Uh, let me ask you a question, phases. This demo that showed were like a robot which is two feet high. We actually had a grand opening of a new building in Southern Maryland about a year, year plus ago. The governor was coming. So we actually took a robot, put a stand and make it higher. We make it like a bartender. So the robot is coming to you with some lotion and thing. Uh, so in fact, what people are doing right now, you know, we don't have, honestly speaking, I was just doing navigation, moving around, but this appearance of my robot is not really very, 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 what I call friendly or charming, right? Even if you look at Amazon, right? They designed this robot, the Astro, it's like a small, less than one and a half feet robot. A, a lot comes up and you can, it has like a screen, like an iPad screen, which shows you like some, some expressions. So that the question you're asking is, you know, how do we design a robot, which is ultimately friendly to human? That that's the thing Amazon is doing because Amazon targeting your grandmother and small kids, you know, that they will like to interact with it. But I think the question you have is great. And, and there's still lots of issues about how do robots acknowledge the presence of human? What, what aspect of robot will make it human friendly? And I, I think we're still in the early days as this field of HRI gains importance, you know? What kind of robot capabilities or features are more human friendly? We'll have to really design them. And this will also involve lots of, lots of user evaluation, something that our HRI community is working on. So I think this are, these are both the question you ask are like, you know, as, as robot technology matures and robot indeed come to our daily life, uh, we're gonna start worrying a lot about the question you guys are asking. So I don't know if, I, if that's the answer you're looking for, but you know, it's still early days and, and that's something we want, to, we want to work more as we develop. I'm hoping, you know, we just build a navigation technology and somebody- yeah, perfect, thank nice, you so much. That's nice friendly front end to that, yeah, okay. So let me just go on then at least uh, these are great questions. And as we hope the next five, to four, five, seven 10 years, robots come up, people will have better answers to that. But, but we are definitely seeing the technology is maturing that we can do this navigation. So let me move from indoor scene to outdoor scene. And this is actually, we're doing a lot of work with army people. Uh, in indoor scenes, the floor was flat, like a nice concrete floor or, or hardwood floor. We were dealing with people you know, avoiding people and, and we do make people friendly. The moment you go outdoor, like I go around in my elite building, there's some amazing terrains or just go outside when you go for a walk evening, right? When you go to outdoor, typically you don't see big crowds. Yes, there could be crowds, but dealing with crowds is not the biggest focus because outdoor is big and open. The biggest challenge outdoor happens to be is the two big challenge talk about one is terrain because you, terrain is not smooth you got a pavement, uh, you got a, it rained, it's, it's muddy, it snowed, you know? So there are many challenges come up. Your, your ground is not smooth, elevation comes up. So one of the biggest problems of a robot is where can it navigate? Especially the robots I'm using, I'm using Jackal or Husky, and I show you Spot. These robots are not as powerful as humans. You know, young humans can run, walk and do terrains, most of the robots are wheel, spot is like a platform, we're using it. So figuring out what is navigable terrain, that itself becomes a very hard problem. And you have the terrain problem, your robot dynamic constraints. You know, robots, wheel robots can only do so, they cannot go up the stairs. That's it. If you're Roomba at home, on the floor, you want to take different level, you do it by hand. So the, the terrain problem becomes quite difficult. So here again, you know, this is some work we're doing. 
again, using similar framework, this on a Maryland campus. So we build a simulation environment and this is like a Husky robots outdoor scene with dynamics done. We are trying to simulate the dynamics of the robot to see with the figure of this robot, can it go up this terrain? And maybe it go out with this path. It could not go out this path because the elevation is too steep. So this is just an example of, again, how we similar terrains. Now this is totally empty, but the elevation. So two questions, can my robot even go up that hill? You know, robot looks like automatically, can it go up the hill? And if it can, what path it should pick up? So now we bring all the sensing and a lot of, again, decision-making just to deal with the, with the elevation. So again, we bring DRL, reduced safety regions, and now instead of dealing with prediction of humans and, and their velocities, we are performing a lot of terrain analysis on the fly, cost map elevation. And once we have the terrain analysis, we figure out the navigation. So different challenges have come up in outdoor terrain. So again, we bring a different kind of thing, but instead of dealing with a lot of humans, we have different sense in local robot autometry, pose, elevation map. So this is a big chunk of elevation map on the fly. Because even I told you, you know, why does Google or Cruise go to Phoenix? Phoenix is a beautiful place, but it's flat. It's almost sunny. And a lot of interest, roads are nice. So developing in a city which is flat, not many hills. Of course, San Francisco has a few hills, but very flat, sunny. You don't see different days like in DC. Today is sunny. Yesterday was cloudy. Two days ago was rainy. We, we have more weather variation here. That changes all the lighting. So, so we have to have terrain analysis. That's a big chunk we put. So we use two networks here. This is computer vision network. We call DL network of perception. And this is our similar network I present, DWARL. It's called Network Reinforcement Learning. And there's a big debate between, shall we do one end-to-end -end perception and planning or shall we decouple? We went for decouple reason and, and uh, for decouple networks and this said, but the only challenge that brings up is, let me also do one more thing. All these networks are running on the GPU on the edge. So this becomes another challenge. A lot of wonderful computer vision. If you go to CVPR, you see those fantastic papers but they're running on Amazon cloud, you know, and nowadays transformers, diffusion models, you know, the explosion is going around. They take a lot of GPU. In my case, all this work has to run robot GPU on the edge. Like when I work with army, they said this robot is going to a terrain. You got no Wi-Fi, you got no 5G, do everything on the edge. So that brings a whole new challenge of what machine learning I can do on edge GPU that comes up here. But let me just show you what we could do. You know, I'll just show the results of this. So this is again of College Park, our campus. You see the hill, right? Now you can see the robot here. You know, it's the previous method. It took a wrong thing. It'll get stuck. Here's our method figuring out it could go out like this. Of course, there were some steps that avoided, but this is partially you can see results here. Figuring out previous method, they did not take the right method. They'll get stuck with our method here on the left is able to do the navigation, look at the terrain elevation and figure out the way to go. So just like we do, what path you should take if you're going on a, on a hill tracking, same kind of thing we're doing, taking our robot accounts. So this is again, this is flat, but this robot, you know, figuring out where the sideway walk is. You want to go the sidewalk, but you want to avoid the rocks because the wheel robot cannot go over the rocks. So we're doing lots and lots of terrain analysis. And one challenge that comes up is, the real world terrains are very much varying. Now, computer vision relies on a lot of data. You get a lot of data sets. You find data sets of, of course, ImageNet, you get data sets of homes. Not many people in computer vision because they're driven by commercial companies are dealing with this terrain. So dealing with outdoor terrains, you're not much data. So we have to come up with something called more supervised or self-supervised method, deal with it, and you come up there. So this becomes you know, all kind of challenges that we're dealing with, you know, elevation changes, surface properties, right, rock versus mud, and unstructuredness. You see, especially with army, they want us to, this robot to go through some dense grass, vegetation. And I'll tell you about, I'll show you an example on that. We work on surface properties, traction, bumpiness, terrain happens. Now, so far we're mostly using visual sensor, LIDARs and cameras and some IMUs, but touch is a big part, especially when you can't see the ground well or visibility is low, 
you rely a lot on your how your foot grips on the ground. My robot does not have good good vision haptic sensors. We're doing pseudo haptics. So this is still I'm hoping to convince you that dealing with unstructured outdoor environments, we are a long way to go because all these problems are very hard. Now, what we can do today, some of the work my students have done in the last year and a half or two, because we don't have a lot of data, of terrain data, we designed what is called more self-supervised learning. The idea is that online supervised learning you do is basically computer robot-specific surface cost map. This cost map is our metric for navigability. Based on the cost map, we decide what it can do or cannot do. That's what really happens there. So this is just our therapy network. We present this one of the robotics conferences where we introduce a surface self-supervised network where on the fly robot figures out based on the error and perform navigation because there's just not a lot of terrain data available, something we can't simulate. So this is an example of, you know, you can see comparisons. The, our latest version is on the bottom right. You know, how it navigates different situation. Previous method did not do terrain analysis, get stuck in the rocks. Our job is to figure out where to go and avoid it. So figuring out what Spaces to traverse is a big chunk of the job here. You see, a lot of previous method did not do a good job of rock detection. They went over the rock, got detected, but we got light terrain analysis, so we chose a smoother region because our perception was much better right here. So this is this is the come up. Then over the last one year, you know, there were a lot of excitement about legged like, robots. They're getting Boston Dynamic video you see on the web, Ghost Robotics. Now you see beautiful videos from Boston Dynamics, but I'll tell you 99% of videos that you see on the internet, they are human driven, like they tell you operated by human, like a human is guiding the robot, which is okay. Our goal is autonomous, autonomous, autonomous. Now these Lego robots are good. They can even go up and down the stairs because the dynamics and control is there. Suddenly you can do more things you cannot do, but now we're dealing with more difficult terrains. So the robot perception encounters noise, occlusion, and the different error mode I'll show you. As you're moving, the cameras undergo motion blur, low lighting, and occlusion and LIDAR. And so the challenge we are working is that we realize to build a good autonomous navigation system, we need some sensor fusion. We not one sensor will do it. LIDARs, cameras, IMU, pseudo haptics. I'm looking into all possible sensing combination because real world is too complex and I cannot figure out the complexity real world by few sensors. That's what we're trying to do here. So we build, build like a sensor view network. We use idea from graph with prediction models, which are good to integrate the sensors. And there were a lot of properties we had to show, you know, certain proper convergence reward function work well with positive definiteness. So I can point to the paper where a lot of math went into it, making it happen. So you're seeing this terrain like this. So my robot, my army collaborators want my robot to go through this tall grass spot, you know, not many robots will do this. This looks like a lot of mess. And I have to figure out what is traversable, what is not traversable. That's, the, you know, we are just changing the unstructured of the environment. Again, this is the different sensors we have done so far with mostly LIDARs and autometry. We are taking haptics to it to go in different situations. So this is where the challenge comes up. You know, you're dealing with different kinds of outdoor scene. This is relatively clean. This is some grass. This is rough terrain. And our goal is to deal with all things. This is hanging leaves, pliability. So one question we, for humans is trivial. You all humans know this is soft grass. You can walk through it. Robot vision is not good enough to figure out a soft grass. It could be a hard bush. It could be a steel wire. So a lot of material properties, we have semantic information. My computer vision today does not have semantic information. So that makes all kinds of challenges for robot. We have to solve the vision problem. So this is our current system. We took a spot. Now spot has some inbuilt uh, you know, autonomy, but it's not good enough. We put our own LIDAR, we put Intel NUC, but then we had to, since we put our old sensing and old GPUs, everything, we had to put a big power supply to run it. So you can see I had to put a lot of, spend $160,000 on the big spot robot and did a lot of infrastructure on top of it to make it happen. So this is the example of what you can see. Now, my robot has to figure out automatically it can go through this grass. So this is purely autonomous navigation. My robot figure on the grass where it would go through. It could go through here, it would not go through here. So this is half the job done is what is navigable. And you'll see, you know, we compare with different methods here, including our previous own work, how it happened. This is our setup with all the hardware and, and the sensors there. 
and you see the performance we get in different situations. So on the top left is our case, but previous methods like this one are too conservative. They just stop or this one will go wrong way. So in this grass, you can easily go a wrong way and a wrong way will cost you a lot of challenges. So again, you know, different kind of outdoor scene. None of them is very structured. So this is where we keep on testing. You know, we test right now at our campus. We go with army. They want to test in and get to score. In fact, army has some challenging goals. They want to go robot to go through very tall grass. So army goals are just too ambitious. Something they want to show at a, like a, a 10 X demo, but we're not there yet. And, but again, you can see, you know, how we are traversing different outdoor scenes and <clears throat> the spot has the dynamics to go through that. It works here. So this is just example of what we can do today, you know. But I again want to say, this is a low lighting condition. Come up at night, we need more haptics. But the biggest challenge I'm facing right now is semantic scene understanding. Uh, computer vision still is not good enough here, you know. How to feel hardness? That, that becomes the hardness. So just an example, you know, people say do it. So this is our own, our own campus. We look at all the places. This is like outside our Dean Engineering College. So this is tall grass. And this is bus plus dynamics does automatically this is what our system does. So you can see the difference in our terrain analysis and our navigation. So we figure out where to go and go through it nicely. But if you go wrong path, boss and dynamics will get stuck. And this is what happens. So the thing is, you know, the dynamics robot is not, it's not, it's not very powerful. So let me play this again. So figuring out what path is traversable is very important. You take the wrong path. The, the 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 grass will get stuck in the wheels thing and it'll fall over. This happens all the time. And not to say this robot is very expensive. So this is exactly just showing the challenges. And let me show other examples. Other kind of tall grass, you can see all kind of funny outdoor scenes. We are testing it. <clears throat> so in this case, my system decided it's too complex. It, it could not do it, it stopped. But Boston Dynamics system went through, was bold, and then it got those, those stuck rock leaves and you see what will happen there. It just got stuck. So this is just making a decision that this is too dense for the robot to navigate. Like I know even humans, you make a decision, can you go or not? So this is the kind of challenges we're really facing here. So that's so much about, you know, for robot navigation. Let me just show one briefly, one project, I'm running out of time, you know, like this perception planning and control, you know, if they're still in general, they're not easy problem, but if there's some application you can do it well. So the project I did with autonomous excavator, we took excavators, which are used for this thing. And they put lots of the sensors, you know, on the excavation, the goal was to build autonomous excavator. This appeared in science robotic last year and got a lot of coverage. But this is a Go project I did. I'll just quickly show a lot of computer vision. We had a team of about 20 people in industry doing all kind of computer vision for terrain analysis, for excavation. So you deal with like de-dusting, construction areas, a lot of perception, a lot of planning, a lot of control. So this is, we want to build an autonomous excavator system. It's like a one specific task, kind of task you want to do. We take all computer vision, all motion planning and control, customize it for this application. It was quite a human intensive, but we want to demonstrate an autonomous system just to show it can be done. This is motion planning control. So this is like an excavator working on a caterpillar thing. You see on the left, <coughs> there's a human operator who's digging up on the big grass and doing it. On the right, our system working autonomously. It's a lot of sensing, tearing, looking at where the sand should be. It figure the grip and lift that toxic sand. This is like a toxic area where autonomous excavator is working, how, how things can come together. Again, I apologize, I will not go into detail of that, but even our autonomous system, we found had close to 80 to 90% human efficiency. It's not as good as human operator, but we're getting there. So this is something we demonstrated a couple of times in a big places. You see the excavator, the big exhibition show, except it was working totally autonomously. So the reason I want to show this is that this is, if you can narrow down the problem, you know, of course, unstructuredness is still too hard. It's like, this is like a semi-structured problem. It's not as structured as Amazon warehouse. It's not as bad as outdoor terrain. It's somewhere in between. But for this particular kind of system, we put our computer vision, planning, control with a team of 25 people over three years. If you have one application which you can customize it, that's to show autonomy we can achieve. So this is an example of how it works. You know, 
This is again, a lot of toxic material where humans don't want to work on minings, this potential of this area. And you can see the driver's view. This is except on the right, it's all autonomous. You see the sand hill, you're picking it up and kind of going it through the hole. This is like a very monotonous operation. The reason we could do this well is because there were no humans. You know, humans always make such a difficult. We did an experiment. We want to show it can operate for 24 hours. So this is like a 24 hour video that was running. You can see midnight, morning, noon, evening. So that we achieved, and this is actually being deployed. So this is, I want to show the kind of autonomy that can work in real world. But this was, as I said, a semi-structured situation and we develop a lot of customized computer vision planning and control for this application. Of course, if you take it to a different kind of situation, would it work? No, generalization is very hard. So that brings up to you know, the conclusion, you know, what, what we're learning in the robot system navigation. Let me tell you, we all talk about autonomy, autonomy, autonomy. In my context, I just think autonomy is still too hard. In spite of the media hype, and this is what we're learning from autonomous driving industry, they spent close to $50 billion and nobody's deploying it. I think people don't realize autonomy is hard, and especially I know you guys at Hopkins are working about assured autonomy or explorer autonomy. All we have is proof of the concept system, giving any kind of guarantees like, you take my first robot, talk to a different crowd, how will my system behave? I'm not 100% sure. You change the lighting condition in my lobby, Hold my system change, I'm not sure. Outdoor scene, you go from green grass to brown grass to rainy day, how my system behave, I am not sure. So one message I want to tell you today is that autonomy is hard. And one challenge comes up is when we integrate perception planning and control, perception done a long way. My computer vision friend, thank you. My robotics friend, thank you. Control people, thank you. But when you combine them, the worst of each comes in the picture. The so Ambrose's law, the lowest part, a small perception failure get amplified by planning. So this is the integration and we don't teach a lot of integration to skills. And of course, as I said, we are living in the world of data-driven machine learning. You know, it's great, but data-driven machine learning is subject to all the corner cases. And when you want autonomy and corner cases, no. And as I said, this is a lesson we are learning computer AI community that autonomous car companies have spent 50 to $100 billion, they spend millions of miles in Phoenix, San Francisco, and they're still not deploying a large scale. What does it tell you? We are not there yet. A lot of potential, like I showed excavators, some estimation will be done, but the general case is hard. So this brings to the conclusion slide, you know. I'm very happy that I said in the beginning of the talk, after being in 40 years, of course, could I, 30 years ago, could I build a robot going through the crowd? No way. Could I build an excavator without human 24 hours? No way. Of course, we have a lot of success. You know, this excavator is being deployed. But I want people in computer vision, robotics, and control to come together because we have to build integrated systems, especially indoor scene and outdoor scenes. RB people have some crazy challenges. You know, if they were to deploy these robots in, let's say, place a Ukraine terrain, I don't know how we're going to do it. We're nowhere close to it. And the challenge is to go for uncontrolled situations. And of course, as the robots get deployed, how do we build good home and robot system? The two questions you guys asked are really relevant here. We are, we're definitely not there. So I'll just stop here. Thank you all my sponsors. And hopefully I still have some time for question and feedback, but thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Dinesh. Are there uh, any questions? Okay. Thanks. So, Everyone? I'll ask a question. Um, so maybe maybe I'm mixing, maybe I'm conflating too many things here. But you know, in order to to show kind of general robotic autonomy, I, I'm thinking that you know you need a huge training set, similar to like Chat GPT. Even though there they're talking about large language models, here we're talking about different types of models. But but it seems that you know if you're not able to train on so many different terrains, then whatever you're gonna be deploying is specific to a, to a particular terrain, for example, in the legged robots. Are there thoughts, it, it is, when, when ARL asks for this kind of capability, do they understand that 
you know, behind-legged robots that operate maybe in desert situations and foliage situations, and the training is very different for all of those. Yeah, so that's the two part of your question. You know, whatever. So, Chat GPT is an interesting thing. You know, of course, it's a great success story that what it did and did it. At the same time, we all know Chat GPT give a wrong answers and semantic information not there. So, it's a it's a good success for large language models and how they're train taking all the texture data. There's a lot of discussion about you know, could we take the idea of chat, let's take the positive part of Chat GPT. You know, they took all this text, all the novels and all the text on the internet. Could we take all the videos of terrains in the world or all the LiDAR sensors? You know, even, even Google's and the and the cruises, they drove millions of miles. They collected a lot of data, but that data is for roadsides. And as you said, at least Army wants to go terrains, the deserts, uh, you know, uh, or the jungles, you know, how much data we have. So first, how much data we have? And if somebody could take all the data and run this network for two months and train it, I'll be very happy, you know? We haven't seen, I think people are looking into what they could do for language in, uh, in the case of chat GPT or large language models. Could that be applied to vision? Could we take all the terrain data from the world and do it? That would be nice. But let me also mention one more thing I keep on saying. One problem that makes my problem very hard here is edge computing. Even with Amazon, you know, I talk to Amazon, you don't realize, Amazon sending you a robot which should at least work for two hours, just like Roombas. You know, Roomba should vacuum your home home for like one hour. Amazon only has three A6 in their robot. They don't have a GPU. So let me keep in mind all the large language models, all this God knows billions of trillions of parameters they're using and all the GPU power they're using. I don't have that GPU power on my robots. So there's a whole new challenge of you know, low power edge computing. So what machine learning I can do? So you can see lots of problems come up there. There's another question in, in the chat. Um, says from Dennis Bartko, says, first, thank you for an excellent talk and sharing your work. I found it very valuable. I believe you mentioned that when working inside, the algorithm are considering the feet and legs of people as input to predict their, mo their movement. In sports, it is said that it's best to track the angle of the hips when trying to predict the motion of an opponent. Have you considered this approach in your work? Uh, could you just, is it on the chat? I, I'm not seeing on the chat. Yeah, so it's in the question and answer section. Oh, 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 let me just see that. Okay. Can you just repeat the last part again? There's something I didn't get the last part. Just repeat it. I, I can't see In sports, it's said that the best way to track uh, track the angle of the hips when trying to predict the motion of an opponent as opposed to the feet and the legs. Oh, okay. That's oh, that's a very, I, I didn't know that. I would love to hear from There's some work on, you know, people are doing a lot of kind of competitive vision in sports. You know, we saw that in World Cup soccer. So yes, if if you are saying like in our work, you're right. We were see my robot was low, and we're looking at yellow and legs. So you're saying I could make my sensor go a little bit up and look at hips. Uh, if there's a if I can get more information on hips, I would definitely love to use that. No, I'm not aware of that. And if that can make my prediction better, I'll definitely take it. I'm also seeing. I guess this is my colleague John Barras. John, are you the same John Barras, right? My UMD colleague. No, I'm looking for better haptic solution. I think John mentioned that. And John, I'll catch up with you on, you know, I assume that haptic. So haptic is something I've not worked on it, uh, but what haptic I can mount on my spot and do it, I definitely need that. Go ahead, John, you have a question? Yeah. Uh, what, what we're doing in Munich, thanks, uh, Dennis, is we're actually uh, doing the same thing as you would do if you climb a hill or if you climb through grass. I mean, locally you find the slope okay, so and then you go through. And then if you find grass, you the first thing you try to do is because you don't know how resistive it is, you try to push it. And if you can push it and you can have the slope, you go through. Yes. Now, the, trick, the trick of course is to remember if you get stuck in some of the pictures you showed, where you were unstuck before and do it again. That goes, that idea goes all the way back to Shannon when he did the mouse in Bell Labs, sure. where he had to remember. Remember, he did the work, yeah, you're too young to remember. He, he, he did the mouse where he actually would go try to go through the maze. And then when he got stuck, he remember when it was the, the previous point that he could uh, think that he was unstuck and go back there. Any of these ideas going into your work, like try to figure out without, much simulation or much pre-planning, what can I do locally 
and keep going. John, great ideas. Let's talk more. Uh, absolutely, because in fact, one of the previous work I showed, there was something called we call Terra Pen, and exactly we were actually doing the same thing for visual part. Mm. This exactly we do what we call self-supervised learning. You know, I, I, I went over very quickly, but uh, this yeah. is something we have done here. Exactly this, because we basically, you know, we do right, right, yeah. prediction yeah. on this thing. So I think what's just exactly. No, you're right. Sometimes, in fact, we have something we call negative obstacle. You know, as you walk, you, and I think what you're saying is, is a fantastic point, John, that if I go there, I may not know the heart of the surface, I put my foot up and realize today, today, is, today is a rainy day. Or there's a, so sometimes you can't see the surface from the grass. So you learn on the fly that this is a slippery surface. So I'm with you, John. We want to bring less. I, I have, I have, I, I'm happy to hear that because, as you know, I have had a lot of arguments with vision people thinking that they can do everything with vision. I don't okay, believe so. No. But anyway, <laughs> thank you no. again. John, we didn't, humans are multimodal, animals are multimodal. Uh, trust me, even when you walk, you walk on, the, on, on a rainy day, you don't realize when, you're, when your foot is slipping, yes. your brain adjusts to walk slowly. Yeah. We have to be multimodal. We are with you. Hello. Yeah, thank you very much again. Let's catch up, John. Thank you. More thank questions or feedback? I think that's it. So I think we've reached the end. Thank you okay. so much, Dinesh. It was an amazing talk. I think everybody got a lot out of it. And I really appreciate your time. Thank you for the invite. And, and David, I'll follow up with you. Let's 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 bring, you know, given our proximity, we should do more than what we're doing. And uh, let's let's figure out some more way to collaborate. Because as you can see, there are definitely a lot of problems at HRI. There are definitely a lot of open challenges, and we need all the expertise in the world to solve these hard problems. Excellent. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you for inviting and looking for more interaction. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone.